Hello everyone and welcome to today's live webinar, Cancer on a Chip, the Microfluidic 2D and 3D Cell Culture System for Studying Cellular Microenvironment, presented by Dr. Vivek Kamen. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots and I'll be moderating the session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Gibco at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Now let's get started. Today's event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, use that Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present to you today's speaker, Dr. Vivek Common, postdoctoral associate, Florida International University. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Comet, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning. My name is Dr. Vivek Kamath. Firstly, I'd like to thank JIPCO and Thermo Fisher Scientific for giving me this platform to share my work. I would also like to thank Jesse for giving this opportunity to talk about microfluidic 2D and 3D cell culture system for cancer research. To start with, I would like to share some background information and geographical insights about my education, workplace, and academic career. I was born in the city of Pune, also known as Oxford of the East, located on the western Indian state of Maharashtra. The city is blessed with vibrant rich culture and has also the highest number of research organizations in India. I did my graduation and post-graduation in biotechnology from Garbare College and carried my doctoral work at Agarka Research Institute and received my PhD in 2018, after which I immediately joined the group of Dr. Shekhar Bansali at Florida International University in the Department of Electrical Engineering. So to begin with, here are the cancer statistics obtained by World Health Organization, which shows prevalence of cancer throughout the globe. In the image, it can be seen that premature mortality rates are significantly higher and is the number one leading cause of death in 48 countries which are indicated by the blue color, is the second leading cause of death in countries marked with light blue color, and countries with fourth and fifth leading cause of death are marked in orange and red color. It is expected that until 2020, there will be 18.1 uh, 18 million new cases with 9.6 million deaths due to cancer, and therefore cancer research is one of the major priorities in developed and developing nations. So currently the major challenges faced are early detection, cancer prediction, new drug screening, and post-cancer treatment. So to address this challenge, the first experimental step starts from carrying out in vitro cell culture assays. But there is a need to develop better models to study cancer, as we all know, that the magnitude of variation which we receive during performing in vitro to in vivo transitions. So we need better systems because to study cellular functions and behaviors in dynamic condition which mimics in vivo scenarios, understanding the microenvironment is a realistic way and study various core and multi-culture systems which would eventually bridge the gap between in vitro and in vivo system generating realistic data in primary stages of investigation. So let us see how dynamic cellular microenvironment works. Dynamic system is combination of biochemical, physical, and physicochemical factors which constitute cell's microenvironment. As seen in the schematic, cell experiences blood flow, shear stress, pressure drop, uh, stretching, uh, interaction with physical barriers, and collectively imparting physical forces on the cell. Further, there is concentration gradients, exchange of gases, there are chemical signaling molecules, and extracellular molecules which constitute the biochemical factors. And lastly, physiochemical factors such as temperature, pH, collectively interact and affect the cells 
and yet in such a dynamic system, cells are able to replicate and perform its designated function. Uh, but in traditional dish space or you know, no, conventional assays, these functions such as sensing, replication, exchange of materials might be altered as cells do not experience a dynamic environment. It is known that cell exchange mor morphologies when uh, cells, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, it is known that cell changes morphologies when exposed to substrate deformation, but cells in culture plate do not experience these forces and eventually lose these properties. Therefore, studying dynamic system for studying cellular microenvironment without compromising natural properties and behavior of the cells is crucial. Uh, so how can we study such dynamic systems? And one of the, one of the answers is microfluidics. So what is microfluidics? Microfluidics is study and manipulation of small volumes of fluids in channels and chambers with dimensions of tens of microliters. Microfluidic cell culture attempts to develop devices and techniques for culturing, maintaining, analyzing, and experimenting cells in microscale volume. Uh, now, using these microfluidic techniques, we can actually we can actually make devices uh, to carry out 2D and 3D cell culture systems. In the following image, shows a microfluidic chip comprising of inlets for media, a culture chamber in which cells can be grown, and outlet for removal of spent media. So, such chips can be used to culture cancer cells for assessing various different cellular activities. So now let us see what are the differences between in vitro culture and microfluidic cell culture system. In in vitro system, the cell substrate is transparent, stiff, and has low gas permeability. While microfluidic systems, the substrate is soft and is flexible and also has high gas permeability. In microfluidic system, cells can be handled and cultured ranging from single to thousand cell, which is actually not possible in a plate-based assay. Conventional culture is carried out in flask, dish, and plates, which require larger volume as compared to microfluidic devices, which can work with volumes as less as 60 nanoliters. Also, nutrients in traditional culture are in great excess and media needs change after every 48 hours while in microfluidic system, media turnover is faster and some reports indicate more glucose consumption. One peculiar thing about microfluidic cell culture is the proliferation rate. And in conventional assays, the proliferation rate is typically between 18 to 24 hours. But in microfluidic system, there have been reports where it has been shown less as well as faster proliferation rates of the cells. So how do we culture cells in microfluidic systems? Culturing cells in microfluidic devices require a strong understanding of certain fundamental principles spanning disciplines such as physics, chemistry, biology, and engineering. So it's more of an interdisciplinary kind of a study. And there are certain criteria which need to be followed. Firstly, the developed system should closely mimic conditions that exist in vivo, and the person handling should have good command on cell culture techniques to translate methods from macro to a micro scale. I mean, to micro to a macro scale. And this is usually the most challenging part. Also, another criteria is the person should have a strong background in designing and microfabrication techniques. So let us see what are the steps involved in establishing a successful microfluidic culture. So the first step, obviously, is the fabrication of the device. This is typically carried out by techniques such as photolithography and soft lithography after which you have to select the type of cell which you are going to investigate. So it can be cancerous, non-cancerous cells, and based on their properties such as adherent or non-adherent, we might need to fabricate a different or a new design of microfluidic chip. Then we need to perfuse media into the chip, which is usually done using syringe pump or peristaltic pumps. The chips are then monitored using microscopic technique. Um, we usually use uh, live cell microscopy in our lab. And at last, the spent media is collected, which contains all the extracellular components and dead cells. So let us see the first step, which is the fabrication process in detail. So microfabrication process is divided into two parts. One is photolithography and another is soft lithography. So as the name suggests, uh, photolithography is a technique which uses, uh, which is used to edge surface using light, and this is usually a UV source. Basically, in, in photolithography, we have a mask, which is nothing but a stencil on which the design of the microfluidic chip is edged on a silicon substrate, substrate, which is called a wafer. 
a layer of photolysis is coated. Uh, we in our lab we use SU8 for this. After which the mask is aligned on the substrate and UV is exposed. Once exposed for a definite time, the UV light passes to the stencil or the mask uh, and erodes the photoresist uh, at the point creating design on the mask onto the substrate. After etching, the final baking and development is carried out to obtain the substrate with the design. Further, PDMS, which is a known polymer, is called polydimethyl siloxane, is added to the substrate and allowed to cure. Once PDMS solidifies, it is it is peeled off, and the replicated design is uh, and, and the design gets replicated on PDMS. Uh, in case of soft lithography, the mold is first prepared, and then PDMS is just added into the mold and cured. PDMS is a room temperature vulcanizing rubber which solidifies and mixed with curing agent, and this process can be accelerated by applying heat. So after curing, the PDMS is peeled, peeled, and we are left with design pattern on the PDMS. Further, this is the process of photolithography. So as I explained earlier, in the first step, the silicon wafer is removed from the clean room. It is kept on the spin coater. In the third step, the photoresist such as SU8 polymer is added and it is spin at desired RPM to achieve a specific thickness. And then it is pre-baked. After this step, the mask is selected. Step six and seven is aligning of the mask using a mask aligner in step eight, UV is exposed. And finally, in step 10, the mask, uh, the exposed surface is washed. Finally, we have the desired, desired geometry on the wafer. Now this acts as a mold and PDM is added on the wafer, which is allowed to cure and the microfluidic chip is peeled. So in the last image, you can see the design of the microfluidic chips and the channel. In case of soft lithography, the process is quite simple. And I would like to share one step protocol which we use in our lab to design circular micro, micro channels and chambers. Uh, the protocol goes when uh, the protocol describes uh, using agar rose powder, which is readily available, which you can mix with water and allow it to boil. We then cut the tip of syringe and aspirate this agar rose powder and allow it to cool. Once cooled with the plunger, push the agar rose out from the syringe to get a cylindrical agar rose shape. Cut the agarose into desired height and pass copper wire through the agarose cylinder. Then we place this entire setup into a box and you just add PDMS into it. You keep the entire setup at 70 degrees for three hours, which is the curing process. And later, once PDMS is solidified, you just remove the chip and boil it in water. The agarose will melt off and you can simply pull off the wire having circular channels and chambers. And this can be used to culture chips. Uh, culture cells, I mean. So there are certain parameters which need to optimize for successful cell culture. And these parameters are, first is the flow rate. So flow rate can, uh, can be set using syringe pump or parasitic pumps. Usually flow rates can be set to mimic actual flow condition in blood vessels and capillaries, which range from one to 2,000 microliters per minute. Second is the temperature and CO2 control. Cells require physiological temperature and CO2 control. Therefore, you can use a PID controller uh, with heating plate coupled with CO2 controller, or there is also an automated on-stage incubator with CO2 systems which are available, uh, which can be mounted on microscope to perform live cell imaging. And uh, lastly, we also need to monitor the cells for which you can use inverted microscope or even less microscope. So using these techniques, we attempted to culture cells in a 2D platform. In the first image, you can see the microfluidic chip, uh, which was fabricated using photolithography. The chip consists of inlets and outlets, which are interconnected to small chambers, which are 100 micron in height and 3 mm in diameter. Media containing DMEM and F12 supplemented with 10% FBS was used for the experiments, and we selected MDMB 231 cells for our study. After the chip was fabricated, the chip was coated with polyallicin and fibronectin to allow cells to adhere. Then MDMB 231 cells were inoculated in the channel and allowed to incubate, incubate for two to four hours. This is crucial since cells uh, need some time to the substrate and we cannot immediately start the flow rate. After two to four hours, syringe with the media is placed in the pump and at a set at a, at a desired flow rate and connected to the chip. Uh, we need to take care 
not to uh, not to set the flow rate too high because that would end up uh, leading formation of bubbles, which is a major challenge in microfluidic uh, 2D and 3D cell culture systems. Further, we incubate the system at 37 degrees Celsius with 5% CO2. Uh, we monitored the cells by recording time-lapse imaging of the cells after every three minutes for 12 hours at the different flow rates. And I have a sample video uh, which shows the migration of the cells. The flow rate was three microliters per minute. And from our data, we came to a conclusion that flow rate has negligible effects on cell migration. Uh, in this time-lapse, it can be seen that cells are growing in flow condition but are not affected by flow rate. Uh, rather, we can also see some cells which are migrating in the opposite direction of the flow. Uh, also, it was noted that cell proliferation was much slower, uh, although these findings are still under investigation, but our initial proof of concept. Further, we also found that cells do tend to adhere to the side walls of the microfluidic chip as compared to the central region. Uh, this is uh, probably due to low pressure at the side walls as compared to the central region and uh, uh, also due to high surface roughness at the edges which provide better contact points for the cell. Uh, another recent investigation which we are working on is testing of different drug-loaded nanoparticles on cancer cells. Uh, in our finding, post 6R treatment, cellular death and cell shrinking was observed, but strikingly after 12 hours, uh, we do observe some cells trying to re-establish and proliferate, uh, which might be useful to explore drug resistance and uneven diffusion of drug in continuous flow. Uh, this might help uh, develop better drug molecules to treat cancer. Although these studies look simpler, there are several challenges which are encountered in microfluidic system, the major being controlling evaporation rate and generation of bubbles. Uh, so. In the image C, you can see that you usually end up having these bubbles in the microfluidic uh, chips, which is a major challenge. But overall, if these problems are taken care, uh, it's easy to establish a 2D or a 3D cell culture system. Now, when we come to a 3D environment, everything changes. So 3D tumor models are most ideal to study cancer. Abnormal growth of cells lead to tumor formation and uh, you know, tumor comprises of several cells in clusters, and this makes it challenging to work with. So I think in the schematic, tumor cells experience non-uniform exposure to nutrients and oxygen. Uh, there is difference in proliferation gradient along with altered cell signaling. Uh, also, exposure to drug is limited because most of the cells are on the surface, and the, and the cells at the core of the tumor do not get exposed to the drug molecules. But but technically, this is what is in real condition, right? So how do we develop tumor models in continuous flow system? So our first step of study was to investigate different scaffolds which would serve as a 3D architecture for the cells to grow. So we selected gelatin, cellulose, PDMS, and one normal scaffold, which is a carbon-based scaffold for our study. Uh, the study is still under investigation, but I would like to share some very primary study results. So the average pore size of the scaffold ranges from 5 to 50 micron, which depends on the synthesis protocol and how we make the different scaffolds. Uh, I, have, I have incorporated an image of the scaffolds uh, and primary studies we did uh, using a six-well plate assay, where we carried out uh, different biocompatibility studies and also MPT assay. So initially, we tested the biocompatibility, and it was found that these scaffolds are pretty biocompatible, like uh, we tested the studies on NIH and uh, MDMB231. Further, these scaffolds or was incorporated into microfluidic chip, uh, which was designed in such a way which would hold the scaffolds in the cell culture chamber. So the chip comprises of inlet and outlet uh, with a single large chamber. And this chamber was somewhere around 40 mm by 10 mm in which the scaffolds was placed prior to bonding with the glass slides. Then the medium inlet was connected, and using the same protocol described earlier, we were able to culture cells on these scaffolds. Uh, in the following image, uh, you can see that uh, we have this experimental setup where we connect uh, the media to the chip, but uh, this entire setup is usually uh, on an on-stage incubator uh, under the microscope, or also uh, you can place this entire setup in 
in a in a CO2 incubator. So one of the technical uh, problems which we were facing during our studies was that when we stain the scaffolds, uh, we usually end up with a uh, dye uh, which remains back in the scaffold, and it is very difficult to image them. So as you can see, we when we tried using gelatin and PDMS scaffold, we were able to see cells growing in voids of the scaffolds uh, and establish small tumor-like structures. Uh, nevertheless, we were able to establish the these uh, cells in the scaffolds. Uh, we also observed similar results when we used uh, PDMS scaffolds uh, and also cellular scaffolds. Uh, as you can see that uh, we have uh, these tumors, uh, tum tumor spheroids which are growing on these cellular scaffolds after three days of incubation. Uh, lastly, uh, the, the the scaffold which we are right now, we are, which we are working on is the carbon-based scaffold. And uh, in the first image, you can see that, you know, it, ha it has an interwoven network of these uh, fibers along. And we, tr we tried growing cells in these fibers. And uh, we were pretty successful in uh, growing cells up to 14 days. Uh, as you can see in the image, uh, we, we ended up with uh, tumor mass of cells ranging from 100 to 200 microns in diameter. Uh, at present, we are working to characterize the scaffold and tumor bodies, uh, and I have not included the data in the presentation. So to summarize, microfluidic cell culture microchip was successfully fabricated using photolithography. A simpler method for fabricating was uh, explored using soft lithography. We did not saw any influence of flow rate on cell migration. Uh, cells prefer to grow in the region of low pressure along the side walls of the chip in the 2D microfluidic chip and 3D cell culture was established in continuous flow by incorporating different biocompatible scaffolds. Lastly, uh, we were successfully able to culture cells uh, up to 14 days uh, which eventually turned out to be tumor, uh, which eventually turned out to be uh, scap uh, tumor, tumor cells. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge my mentors, Dr. Shekhar Bansali for providing me the opportunity to work in his lab, Dr. Dhananjay Bodos and Dr. Kishore Parknikar for his excellent mentoring and support during my PhD. It eventually made me independent researcher. Uh, my colleagues and friend, Dr. Natalia and Dr. Elnaz for their scientific inputs and help for this work. And lastly, Isabella and Dennis who are working with me on this project and we are exploring newer possibilities every day. Uh, thank you, and you can reach me out on these contact listed. Any questions? Dr. Kamat, thank you for your presentation. Okay, so let's get started with our Q&A. Just a quick reminder to our audience on how to submit questions. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, any questions that we are unable to get to today, Dr. Kamat will be answering them via email. So don't worry if we don't get to your question right away. Okay, let's see. Our first question is, why not use serum free medium culture conditions? Hello, yeah, uh, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Our, Valerie is asking, why not use serum-free medium culture okay. conditions? Okay, yeah. So basically, like when we started doing the studies, like uh, I never tested with serum-free media because uh, usually uh, the thing is uh, um, when culturing cells in these kind of microfluidic devices, uh, I usually end up with uh, less cell viability if I start using uh, media free of serum. So usually media supplemented with 10% FPS is the most ideal uh, condition. Uh, and in that kind of a condition, we usually get cells uh, proliferating in a much better way rather than using me, uh, media free of serum. Thank you. Now we have a question mm -hmm. coming in from the University of Michigan. What is the size of organoid when you finish 14 days scaffold culture? 
yeah uh, so after 14 days of uh, after 14 days of the culture uh, when we measured the size of the scaffold when we measured when we measured the size of the organoids uh, we were able to get uh, somewhere around 80 to 150 micron size uh, scaffold uh, organoids um so that was it yeah thank you here's our next question when performing cell migration studies what was mm -hmm. the seeding density of cells in the chip and okay. how did the flow rate how was the flow rate optimized for the study okay um so when performing the migration study we basically seeded 10 plus to four cells in the microfluidic chip and uh, to optimize the flow rate uh, basically we started from three microliters per minute and went up till 100 microliters per minute which is the which is similar to the Mm, flow rate observed in our trees and veins and uh, so in that in that way we were able to see the uh, cells migrating um, um, in against the flow rate also um, and uh, that was the that was the condition how we set up the experiment now dr kumat do you have mm -hmm. experience with co-cultures of cells um we haven't tried co-culturing cells yet uh, but soon I'll be working on a co-culture system with uh, astrocytes and neural cells um, using the same PDMS or uh, the carbon-based scaffold. We have another question coming in here. Uh, you mentioned the scaffold had an approximate pore size of 50 UM. However, some of mm -hmm. the spheroids you observed were 100 UM in diameter. Does yeah. this suggest yeah. that the scaffold was flexible enough to stretch, allowing a larger spheroid? Mm -hmm. So, um, in the initial studies, uh, microscopic studies, which I have observed, uh, although the pore size uh, of the uh, is smaller, usually the cells uh, tends to cling on these uh, scaffolds or these grooves. And usually we see at some points that the scaffold is flexible. In case of PDMS, we did observe the scaffold to be quite flexible and cells uh, um, growing within the scaffolds. And then they, they, we also see some of the cells uh, growing outside the scaffold, making a larger spheroid kind of a structure. So yes, the scaffolds are um, flexible, but that also depends on type of the scaffold. So we did not saw that in case of carbon-based scaffold, but in PDMS uh, scaffold, we did see that the uh, scaffold is quite flexible and we usually get up with large spheroids. Thanks for that question, Jeffrey. And we actually have another one from him. We're gonna go on to this one. Did you observe significant non-specific cell binding to the tubing interfaced to the PDMS chip? Uh, yeah, that's a good question actually, yeah. So it usually ends up that we, we do see a lot of cells uh, which bind to the tubing, um, but not a significant amount of cell, but yes, uh, cells do uh, tend to adhere to the tubing as well as to the channels, the inlet channels specifically at the inlets and the outlets. So, uh, if 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 to give a rough, a rough estimate, around five to ten percent of cells, uh, seeded cells, we usually end up into the tubings and into the inlets and the outlets of the chip. Thank you, Dr. Kamat. And mm -hmm. here we have another question: Have you investigated the effect of different culture media on the growth and metabolism of cancer cells grown ex vivo? uh no not really actually uh, i have not tested different type of medias yet uh on the cancer cell but uh, um in one of my previous studies we do observe change in morphologies uh, when we use different kind of media in continuous flow cultures but i haven't used uh, a, a, i haven't done a, a complete study uh, using different type of medias yet Okay, and our next question mm -hmm. coming in here. We have so many great questions coming in. As a reminder to our audience, those questions that Dr. Kamad is unable to answer today due to time constraints, he will be answering them via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. All right, let's go on to our next question. How do you make a 3D structure in a microfluidic device? Okay, um, so uh, basically like, uh, 
we are basically making these scaffolds which are uh, of this three dimension and then incorporating them in the microfluidic device so there are several protocols which in which uh, the device itself uh, the scaffolds are built inside the device but uh, before binding it to the glass uh, we do incorporate the scaffolds into the microfluidic device so basically we are not um, making the structures in the device the structures are made uh, separately and then incorporated in the device by bonding it or by plasma bonding it or by other methods um, so uh, in case of pdms usually we make these uh, porous scaffolds and then we incorporate it in, in in these smaller devices and then we carry out the cell culture study so it's kind of easy uh, in a way that uh, we can later on just um, open up these devices and remove the scaffold so we get a uh, we get the entire structure intact, but with cells which are growing on the scaffold. So it's quite easy to extract the scaffold uh, from the devices. And uh, that's how we work. I... Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Mont. Now, what yeah. are the chances of contamination and other troubleshooting? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So uh, we usually end up with uh, the chances of contamination is uh, it depends on on the handling uh, and also on uh, the conditions. Uh, usually, um, you won't get a contamination unless uh, you have properly properly sterilized the media, uh, um, the the microfluidic chip, and other other you know devices and tubings and everything. But uh, uh, usually, if uh, the tubings and the connectors are not uh, taken care of then we usually end up with contamination and also other troubles the major troubleshooting is uh, as i mentioned uh, we usually end up with bubbles which which is at the major kind of uh, issues uh, when using microfluidic devices and also sometimes evaporation rate so if a flow rate is too less we usually uh, it eva usually evaporates the media or something like that and then that's another challenge so uh, it takes a lot of time to optimize uh, these uh, systems, but once it is optimized, uh, it's, it's really, you know, it, it gives real good results. Now, let's go back to the topic of scaffolds. Now, I have a few versions of this question coming in. Was the scaffold treated prior to the experiment? Um, uh, so, what we usually do is we treat the scaffolds with uh, polyalysine for uh, cell adherence so after the after the scaffolds have been prepared we usually wash them in 70% uh, IPA and then two or three washes with PBS and then try to keep the scaffold in DNS water for at least four to six hours and after that we treat it with polyalysine for cell adherence. Now Dr. Kamat was any viability assay performed and if not, which are the assays to characterize the tumor body? Um, so um, actually, we uh, did try uh, to study the cells uh, under the microscope. Um, so basically, other other poly, uh, other assays which can be performed could be a light dead staining or you know ATP generation assay, uh, and also. Um, one can go for Chi67 based assays, which are which is a proliferation marker in tumor cells. So basically, fluorescent based assays can be carried out uh, to study cell viability and proliferation. Thank you, Dr. Kamat. Now we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. drug loaded nanoparticles were used in the study, and how was the study carried out? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is this is one of one of the studies which uh, I've been doing uh, in, in my group, and basically we are making different nanoparticles, uh, which are natural natural polymers, uh, using chitosan or alginate nanoparticles. And what we do is we synthesize these nanoparticles in the range of uh, 100 to 150 nanometers, which are encapsulated with. Uh, anti-cancer drugs such as uh, doxorubicin or black detoxin uh, and then we try to study the effect of these uh, nano drugs on cancer cells in continuous flow con culture uh, so basically uh, using these nanoparticles to study how does cellular uptake or how does uh, the activity drug activity 
uh, and interaction with the cells takes place in a continuous flow kind of a culture. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Now, do you have any yeah. final comments for our audience? Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, I, uh, this field is quite challenging and interesting, and uh, it's uh, we can do a lot of studies using microfluidic cell culture system. Um, traditionally, if it's, it's possible in near future to translate all the in vitro studies to uh, microfluidic systems, it would be really great and would give us a great uh, depth of understanding in studying these uh, cellular uh, microenvironment and cellular interaction at a more dynamic uh, level rather than using the traditional in vitro assay. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I would like to once again thank Dr. Vivek Kamat for his time today and for his important contribution to cell culture research. I would also like to thank LabRoot and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and for your great questions. Again, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labrador will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. You will now be redirected to the registration page for our upcoming webinar on choroid, plexus, epithelial cell, 2D, and modified 3D cell culture models, presented by our next cell culture hero, Dr. Elizabeth Delery. Dr. Delery will be presenting live on July 31st at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there. Bye for now and have a great day.